Okay, it is 11.50 uh, Central Time, I should say. Well, welcome back, everyone. And it is now time for uh, Michael Niehaus. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Well, you should have permission. At least I granted it, so that is that. Find the right desktop. Good. Get the video window out of the way. All right. So my session, we're going to talk about what's new in Windows 11, which, appropriately enough, I am presenting on a Mac. Ignore that part. We'll just keep going. Uh, since I did this presentation at MMS a couple of weeks ago, and it took me about 90 minutes for this session, we've got 30. So I'm really going to fly through this. Uh, there is a big debate around Windows 11, whether or not it's a significant release, which really depends on your perspective. Obviously, there are some significant UI changes. We'll go through those. There are changes to support next generation hardware like the Intel 12th generation Alder Lake CPUs, so that's good. There are some uh, new features beyond the UI changes that don't really impact organizations too much. It's deployed like a standard feature update, not an enablement package, so it's a full in-place upgrade, but that's not really in itself uh, a significant item. The biggest change and the biggest debate from most people was changes in the hardware requirements. We'll talk about that at, at the end, one slide on that one, but uh, most of those hardware requirement changes are around security improvements. We've done some more extensive blogs uh, walking through those and trying to rationalize those. And while I understand the, the reasoning behind them, it's still an interesting debate. Overall, the hardware requirements definitely have nothing to do with performance because there are some newer CPUs that have been released recently that are super slow, uh, like the Celeron type CPUs that are fully supported by Windows 11, but I wouldn't want to wish that CPU on anyone. Uh, so it's, it's much more nuanced discussion. So let's jump in. I have a few different categories of items starting on the user interface side. User interface improvements in Windows 11. The first thing you'll notice is the new start menu. It is of a fixed size. There are three rows of pinned icons. There are, icon, there are these little dots on the right-hand side to go between sets of icons. If you hover over those dots, you'll see an up arrow or down arrow to navigate uh, page to page. You can't expand it even if you got a 32 inch 4k monitor it's still going to be exactly the same start menu size popping up there's also the recommended section uh, you do have some controls over what shows up in there but uh, it's going to show you recommended applications most recently used documentation uh, docs or uh, other stuff like that it is by default centered on the screen there are policies that let you move it if you happen to be the type of person who wants the start uh, the taskbar to be somewhere else on the screen. Yeah, good luck. It's always going to be on the bottom. The start button is always going to be on the left. Uh, so there is some limited customization capabilities around that. Since most enterprises customize the start menu layout, you're probably interested in first what shows up by default. If you're on enterprise or education, the list is reasonable. Uh, if you're on home or pro, the list contains other stuff. Uh, the layout does depend on what you have installed on the OS. So if you have Teams, Word, Excel, Outlook, uh, Office apps, they will show up on the layout if they're installed when you first log in. Uh, on the biggest difference on Home and Pro is there are these dynamic layout tiles that get added. They're basically store apps that get delivered down. So if you are running Pro and you really don't want ClipChamp and Adobe Lightroom and things like that delivered to your machine, you will need to do some start menu customization. The good thing is the layout can be customized. You can configure it the way you want, export a JSON file, and then deploy a policy to the machine using MVM, 
pasting that JSON content in as the, the, the settings. The bad part is there's no GPO for doing the same thing. So you're somewhat forced to use MDM. I did post a blog that talks about how to do that in a hacky manner by taking the equivalent MDM registry keys, exporting them into a file, and then importing them into a new Windows 11 uh, installation that doesn't that isn't MDM enrolled and it works fine, but that would never be supported. So uh, use at your own risk, it works fine, but uh, otherwise you're, you're kind of stuck with this configuration. The old start menu layout policy from Windows 10 is no longer supported, except for configuring the taskbar, which is weird. There is a separate OEM process, but all the OEMs can do is add a few additional icons to the list. So. Uh, most enterprises wouldn't want to use that. They would rather use this pinned list to configure it via JSON. Another gotcha, if you happen to be doing multi-app kiosks, those aren't supported on Windows 11. So you should continue using Windows 10 for any multi-app kiosks. In theory, that comes with the later Windows 11 release, but the current start menu doesn't support it at all. On the taskbar, as I mentioned before, it's always on the bottom. The icons are centered. You can move them to the left via policy. If you right click on it, you get a very short menu and people get all bent out of shape. The task manager is not on that menu. So if you really want that, you need to right click on the start button itself. Uh, the weather display is gone from the taskbar. It's been replaced by a widgets item. You can via policy turn off the items that you don't want to see, but there are uh, really basic controls over that for the end user. So if you leave them on, the end user has to go clicking a couple of levels feet to turn them off. The customization for the taskbar is done pretty much the same as it was in Windows 10. You can configure an XML file and deploy that XML file to the machine. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been improved any from Windows 10, so it sucks just as much as it did before. That's all right. It's probably not worth the hassle to do, but if you're really determined, you can still do it via GPO or via MDM. There is a new action center. So if you click on the network or volume icons, you'll see a, a set of quick icons show up. If you click on the date and time, you'll see notifications and the uh, a calendar. So that's been revamped a little bit as far as the look and feel goes. Overall, not a big deal. There's been a surprising amount of emphasis on rounded corners. So all the standard windows will no longer have the square corners. They'll all have rounded corners. Eh, who cares? The settings application has been reworked some to make it a little bit more organized and a little prettier. There are some enhancements to various settings pages, so it's definitely worth clicking around in it. Uh, it is definitely a lot better than it was originally with Windows 10, but sadly, it still doesn't completely replace Control Panel. Control Panel is still around. You'll still find yourself in it from time to time. Uh, so there is less in Control Panel now, but it hasn't gone away completely. There is a new font being used in Windows 11. If you pay a lot of attention, you'll notice the new font is a little bit heavier, but otherwise it's pretty subtle. You have to be somewhat OCD to notice that difference, but that is being used throughout the, the Windows experience now. There are new capabilities for Snap. If you uh, hover over the Maximize button, you'll see a bunch of options. The options that you see can vary based on the screen resolution. So if you don't see the three column layouts, it just means that your monitor is not wide enough. It needs to be at least 1900, 1920 pixels. Uh, otherwise, you would just see the two column layouts. But if you select a window and then choose one of the layouts, it's going to be like Snap was before. It would snap that icon into the position you chose and then prompt for another application to display in the, the other sections that are available. So it's pretty nice, works pretty well. There are support for multiple desktops as there was in Windows 10. It's been renamed a little bit. You don't see virtual on the name of it anymore, but uh, it's pretty subtle. 
the task view button on the taskbar will show them. Windows tab will show them as well. You can set the background wallpaper separately on each desktop. So if you want uh, different wallpapers, depending on which desktop you're on, you can do that. You can also drag windows from one desktop to another. So when you select a desktop and you see a window that's on that desktop, you can just drag it to a different desktop to move it to a different screen. Multiple displays, if you're like me and you have a machine that you use undocked sometimes and then you plug it into multiple monitors other times, with Windows 10, those windows could go all over the place. They would start off on the multiple displays. You disconnect the multiple displays. Now they all move to the single display. You plug the multiple displays back in again. They don't move back. With Windows 11, now they should move back. My experience with that has been mostly good. Most of the windows have moved back to where I expected them to, so that's a, a nice improvement. The widgets are less annoying than the weather was on the taskbar, but I still don't find them particularly useful. Uh, it is something that can be turned off, fortunately, so uh, do with it what you want. And yes, you can see the weather in there if you really want it. Right-click menus have been replaced with the new UI style. You will see in some cases that the old style menus still show up. Like if you right-click on the recycle bin, you'll see an old style menu. Uh, you'll also see weird behaviors on the desktop. Like if you right-click on the desktop, you'll see a new uh, menu. But then there is a show, show more options item on that menu that brings up the old menu. Why? Well, because the old menu may have additional items added to it by apps like 7-Zip or uh, other applications that extend the shell. Those items don't show up on the new style menus. They only show up on the old style menu. So therefore, the new menu has an option to invoke the old menu. Weird, but it works. The out-of-box experience has been reworked to a format that is weird. It's cramped. All of this left-hand side is just used to display a graphic. Everything else shows up on the right-hand side in a small box, so you have a whole lot less space for things like the enrollment status page if you're using autopilot or something like that. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, it's not like you can change it, so you're stuck using that. Coincidentally, this design is very conducive to a dual screen display, a dual screen device. Maybe at some point Microsoft will, will, will release such a thing, but uh, until then, just uh, look at the pretty graphics. There is system-wide dark mode support. It has improved. You do have to click a little bit before you see things that don't support it, like Notepad and Task Manager, but it is getting better over time as more of the system applications are updated to reflect that. Uh, Third-party applications may require updates to make that work, but uh, it is getting better. There are new, new icons throughout the OS. There are touch improvements, so there's more spaces between buttons, larger touch points, uh, tablet mode went away. There's support for new pens that have haptic feedback. So if you want to use a pen and have it feel like a pencil writing on paper because it's vibrating ever so slightly to represent the feel of writing on paper, great. There are such things available now, but uh, if you're not a pen user, you won't care. There is HDR video support. Uh, it requires driver support and other things from the vendor, so you don't necessarily see that very often, but it is available. There are new emojis available in Windows 11. If you want to have an entertaining uh, Google search experience, go search for EmojiGate and read, about, read up on some of the people getting upset over the emojis not being 3D as they thought they were going to be in Windows 11. Instead, they're all 2D. Who cares? All right, enough on the UI. Let's dive into apps on the application side. File Explorer has a minor UI refresh. Mostly, you'll notice that there are new icons and menus, and uh, eventually, there are rounded corners. 
If you notice the screenshot I have, this was on a clean install of Windows 11 RTM, still had square corners. After you reboot the computer, which presumably has installed an update in that amount of time, uh, they then become rounded corners. So whatever. Uh, File Explorer overall, you, you'll adapt pretty quickly to that one, no big deal. The Windows Store has been completely reworked. It now supports things other than UWP and MSIX apps. You can submit anything to the Microsoft Store, which is good and bad. Good in that you can probably find some things in the store that you want. Bad in that you can find all kinds of garbage in the store that you might not want. Notepad++ is a, a good example here. There are multiple Notepad++ items in the store, all of them unofficial. There's no official Notepad++ in the store that I could find at least. Uh, so who knows, do you really want to install unofficial versions of Notepad++? Uh, you certainly can. They're also an interesting behavior if you have non-admin users and leave the store on. Uh, you can try to install something like Adobe Acrobat Reader and get an error back saying something unexpected happened. Well, what's that unexpected thing? Well, it's that you don't have admin rights to install a native MSI or executable. Now, if they would have packaged that up as an MSIX, then it would have installed just fine. And uh, even weirder is it gets installed into C colon backslash program files, even though the end user doesn't have admin rights. So there are some uh, interesting behaviors in the store as a result. So you may want to look at that, especially for the non-admin users and see, is this something that they're going to run into and call the help desk about? If so, maybe it's something you want to turn off. There is a version of Teams that gets installed on Windows 11. It's not the uh, corporate version of Teams, it's the consumer version of Teams, which also means you can have two different versions of Teams installed on the machine at once. The only way you can really tell the difference between the two is you can look for the worker school text, which is buried in the start menu, or you can look at the icon. If the icon is a white T, that's the consumer one. If it's a blue T, that's the worker school one. Uh, you may want to remove the personal one, which also means removing the, the built-in consumer chat feature as well. Power Automate Desktop is a new app included in the OS. It allows you to do what is now called robotic process automation. Basically, it lets you automate UIs. So if you remember back to the old days of uh, visual test or even SMS installer, similar, it lets you record click by click what you're doing on the desktop and then play it back, or you can manually create a, a script a, a UI automation script to run through. So this is built into Windows. Uh, in my case, I built a nice simple one that launched calculator, click two, click plus, click two, click equals, and then got the result out of the windows and uh, out of the window and displayed it. So it pops up a message that says the value is four. That's nice. Uh, but you might be able to do some useful things with that maybe as part of your imaging process, but uh, whether it gets used otherwise, who knows. One of the surprises that I saw with this one, Power Automate Desktop added itself to run when you log in. That's not a nice behavior. It also added itself as a, an extension in Edge, which at least it can't turn itself on as an extension, so it's disabled by default, but uh, applications that do those sorts of things just generally irritate me. There's a new clock app and it's the weirdest clock ever because the clock app doesn't have a clock. It does all kinds of other things. You can set focus times, you can list your tasks, you can track your progress, you can integrate with Spotify so that when you're focusing, you can play music, you can do timers, you can do alarms, you can display a world clock where your time is this little bitty box in the middle of it but it can't actually display just a clock. I don't know why. It's like they threw a whole bunch of developers and said, here, improve the clock app, and this is what they came up with. 
terminal is in box now, highly recommended. This is one I live in. You can use it for PowerShell and command prompts and uh, other things as well. Very customizable, uh, very nice. One that I wish had been around for many more years. So definitely take advantage of that one. Calculator has been improved as well. It's had all kinds of features in Windows 10. It has even more in Windows 11, like graphing calculators. Apparently it's now been rewritten in C-sharp. Who knows what it was written in before, but it's on GitHub as open source. You can actually contribute to that if you wanna add even more features to calculator. Uh, I actually looked at this application to see just how big is this application now? It's an 18 meg application. So if you wonder overall, why does Windows 11 and Windows 10 for that matter so big? Well, it's a whole bunch of these type, types of things being uh, added into the overall size of the OS. Paint, it's been touched up a little bit. It has some new UI elements, but otherwise the functionality hasn't changed. That's good, that'll make people happy. Photos, also some UI tweaks, some minor enhancements overall, but uh, not a significant change that I can see at least. Snipping tool is resurrected. Snipping tool was going to be replaced by Snip and Sketch. Snipping tool was a Win32 app. Snip and Sketch was a UWP. Now they're going back to the Snipping tool, which is a Win32 app, but they're going to integrate some of the functionality from the UWP app, and you'll then have only one app to worry about. That's good, uh, but it basically says, yeah, we're giving up on that UWP app uh, and going back to something that worked a little better. All right, so we've talked about UI. We've talked about apps. Let's talk more than about core functionality and infrastructure changes in the OS. There's a new SMB compression feature uh, that works out pretty well when you're talking to a supported version of Windows. Oops. I don't know why that won't go away. In any case, uh, you can copy files from Windows 11 to Windows 11 or Server 22 to Windows 11 using compression. Uh, there are some algorithmic checks to only do it right now, at least when it makes sense. So if it transfers 500 meg and finds that only 100 meg of it could be compressed, then it's going to stop compressing from that point forward. But if it finds that more than 100 megabit could be compressed, then it says, all right, it's worth the effort to continue compressing it. So if you're copying around big VHD files or log files or anything that compresses well, you can get significantly higher transfer speeds. You can enable that at the file share level. When mapping a drive with command line options, you can turn it on and off via the registry. So a lot of controls over that capability. Language packs have been changed as well in Windows 11. In Windows 10, there was a move to LXPs, which you could install via the store. They were kind of like UWPs. They installed sort of like a uh, UWP app. Now they've gone back to the LP.cavs for Windows 11. So if you're using one of the core 38 language packs, you can get the LP.cav for those and inject those into your image. There are also five uh, language interface pack languages that are also available via an LP.cab. So those can also be injected into the OS, but the remaining 67 languages are only language, um, sorry, I now have forgotten what LIP stands for, even though I just said it, language interface pack. Uh, but those can't be injected into an image. Those can only be installed by the end user, even if they have admin rights, which is good but they have to use the settings app to do that. So if you've got someone who is in Iceland and wants um, an Icelandic UI, well, they'll have to add that themselves after signing into the OS in English. There is a blog that goes through that in much more detail. Uh, what the overall reasoning for that is, is a bit of a mystery, but uh, at least it solves the some of the challenges that LXPs had with Windows 10 by more or less backpedaling and not using LXPs nearly as much. 
cumulative updates. There are some blogs out there talking about the reduction in the size. Uh, you can see 40% reductions in size. That's great. There have been additional improvements to the combined SSU and cumulative update packaging. That was a little bumpy when it originally came out, but it looks like that's been improved now. Uh, the uninstall process has changed a little bit as a result of that. So you have to do a little bit of searching to figure out what you need to uninstall if you ever wanted to remove a cumulative update. Uh, there's also some oddities then that you don't want to extract the cab file from the MSU. Since MDT does that by default, I'm not sure if you really want to import Windows 11 MSUs into MDT and have it inject those offline, uh, but I haven't tried that myself, so be wary. If you're one of the people using Windows 11 on ARM, it's improved. It now has support for emulating 32-bit and 64-bit apps, as well as partial native code support through ARM 64 EC, which is a good thing overall. The, it's, it's basically a, a major improvement to Windows 11 on ARM. So if you have an exist, even if you have an existing ARM device, just upgrading to Windows 11, you're gonna be much happier with your selection of applications and overall performance. But uh, it still just always feels like an afterthought. Like, when are we going to see more ARM capabilities? Yeah, who knows, but you don't get imaging support with ARM devices in most of the deployment tools. Uh, so uh, you are certainly giving up some things if you go the ARM route. There are some new MDM settings. Surprisingly, those were only published like two weeks ago and they all fit on one screen. So not a significant amount of new policies there. Most of them are related to the new start menu experience and a few related to security as well. There have been uh, some relaxing of the ADMX backed policy support for MDM. This really isn't Windows 11 specific, but it is included in Windows 11 by default. So you don't need to apply an update to get this, but basically it means that there are now 1400 new GPOs that you can also set via MDM, fine. There is a spreadsheet that lists all the new GPO settings, but it's really hard to use because it detects anything as new just by change. So like the uh, Windows update policies have been rearranged. And as a result, the spreadsheet now flags them all as new. You change one word in a description and the spreadsheet tags it as changed. So figuring out from that spreadsheet what is actually new is pretty hard to do. It's also interesting that you now have a Windows 11 spreadsheet that when you download it, just says 21H2 in it, where when you, you can clearly see that when it says 21H1, it's talking about Windows 10, since there wasn't a Windows 11 21H1. But when it says 21H2, you don't really know if it's talking about Windows 10 21H2 or Windows 11 21H2. So I'm hoping that uh, when Windows 10 21H2 ships, that there'll be an updated spreadsheet that makes that more clear, but remains to be seen. Windows as a service with Windows 10 meant two feature updates a year, 18 months of support on Pro, uh, 30 months for the fall updates of Enterprise and Education and five-year support on LTSD. With Windows 11, there are some tweaks to that. Now it's only one feature update per year in the fall. Home and Pro get 24 months, Enterprise and Education get 36 months, and LTSC releases, which eventually should come out for Windows 11, will still get five years of support. So that's a good thing overall. I think the big debate for enterprises with this 36-month one will be, do I deploy each one so once a year, or do I try to do every other year? So you'll start to see some interesting debates around that as well. Windows Update for Business, uh, Aria went through that in much more detail, so I don't need to spend too much time on that, but uh, you shouldn't accidentally get Windows 11 unless you uh, go through and configure policies to force that, which is good. 
There've been some performance changes in theory. I haven't been able to prove this or really see the difference uh, in my own testing, but in theory, foreground processes are now running with even higher priority than they did before. Gamers have done tweaks around this to get the best performance out of their games in the past by tweaking the Win32 priority separation policy on the OS. It doesn't look like this is a change to that, but it could be, but uh, it's been discussed. I have no idea how that's been implemented. In theory, you can resume faster from sleep because the RAM can be kept powered, so it doesn't need to read the RAM from disk. I haven't really been able to see that either, but sounds good. There has been support for the Intel 12th generation Alder Lake processors. Uh, I have seen benchmarks that can show the difference. So if you run Windows 10 on a 12th gen CPU, you can see one set of benchmark results. If you put Windows 11 on the same machine, you can get 15% or so of a performance boost because the OS talks to Intel's thread director to figure out what work should be done on a uh, performance core versus what work can be done on an efficiency core. Performance cores are fast, efficiency cores aren't. So you can get better benchmark results as a result, and in theory, better real world performance and battery life as well. There have been improvements to voice typing, commands, new sounds. There's new Windows subsystem for Linux support for uh, X Windows GUI apps, USB 4 support, Wi Fi 6E support. There are still some things to come, like Android app support that's still in preview, global mute. In an insider build, there's a new mail and calendar app coming sometime in 2022. There is variable refresh support in the OS, but there don't, don't appear to be any drivers that support it yet. Who knows? Will these come in 21 H1 or sorry, H2 as an update, or do we have to wait until 22 H2? My guess is we won't see those until 22 H2. There have been a number of features removed. Uh, I don't know that anyone's going to care about those too much. Maybe if you're using WDS to deploy uh, OSs natively without using your own custom boot image, like you've imported a install.wim into WDS, you won't be able to do that anymore. That's not supported with Windows 11. Uh, the private store went away. So if you were using that in the past, you'd have to find something different. There are a number of apps that have disappeared. Uh, the settings, App, as far as setting default apps in Windows 10, lets you just choose a web browser. In Windows 11, you had to choose each protocol separately. That's annoying. If you were an admin, you already had to do this through the um, DISM commands anyway, so not a big deal. On the hardware requirement side, uh, we could probably spend hours talking about the hardware requirements, but uh, basically it's a 64-bit OS only. It does require UEFI, secure boot, TPM, uh, most of that is tied to secure security. There are some items tied to reliability and compatibility, but really everything is trying to position the OS for enabling the security features that have been in the OS already, even going back to Windows 10. So it's not that these are new security features, it's just trying to set the requirements so that you can use those security features. It took three minutes too long, but that's as close as I could get to 30 minutes through all that stuff. Wow. That's impressive. Compressing an hour and a half talk down to 30 minutes. That's, that's not bad. <laughs> Good stuff there. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we have a quick break coming up before our next presenter, uh, Mike. So like last time, I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to steal the screen, uh, get some information up there. So resume in about six minutes. And then it's going to be uh, Windows 11 and, and Intune a little bit. So see you back shortly. <laughs> 